This cute little thing is a Cavius smoke detector. It goes under various other names like Atom, but this particular one was branded Cavius and was cheaper than the Atom, although I think it is potentially the same item. Designed in the UK, but I probably manufactured in China, I'd guess. Most things are. And uh, when you compare it to the size of a traditional smoke detector, the size difference is significant. It almost looks just like a sound on its own, but with this grill round for actually letting the smoke in for the sensing aspect of it. So I'll put this smoke detector out of the way now. And before we go too deep into this, let's take a look at the theory of smoke detection. This won't take too long. The two common techniques used for detecting smoke in the home are ionisation and optical. The ionisation works like this. You have two metal plates and you have a piece of radioactive material which ionises the air in between them. And the sense, the word radioactive, it can apply, you know, it conjures up this image of chunks of plutonium. In reality, it's this tiny, tiny little pellet of americium. It really is just a trace quantity, just what's required. And it's primarily an alpha emitter. It does have a byproduct. It does emit gamma rays, but not very many. And that ionises the air in between. And when you've got a grill that lets smoke in, the smoke interferes with that. So the ionisation of the air actually makes these very slightly, it creates a very slightly conductive trail almost like a smoke-dependent resistor. It probably is seen by the circuitry just as something like a resistor like that. But when smoke gets in and it interferes with the ionisation process uh, from the radioactive material, the value of that resistance goes up. It, doesn't, it isn't able to ionise the air as easily and the uh, resistance uh, suddenly goes up and that's how it detects smoke. Optical is actually a lot simpler. It doesn't involve messing around with radioactive materials. And these days, the optical approach, because it's much more sensitive to very low levels of smoke, it's becoming the more prevalent smoke detector. It detects what they call smouldering fires, where there's just a slight haze in the air, because the ionisation type does require quite a density of smoke. The optical one will detect slow smouldering fires. That The importance here is that if you've got a far smouldering in a room, it will start consuming the oxygen in the room and there is a risk that the levels of carbon monoxide could get quite dangerous. So that, that's the main advantage of the optical one. But the optical technique of sensing is you've got an LED that emits infrared light. And uh, at right angles to that, or at whatever angle they deem the most optimum, you've got a sensor. And normally, the light, uh, the sen sensor can't actually see the emitter. But when smoke gets in there and uh, reflects the light from the sensor, it changes the amount of light that the sensor can see because the sensor is almost, it's always going to see a very small trace quantity of light and that's partially used for testing the unit as well. It's always going to see a very slight reflection. And when the smoke detector sees an increase in the uh, optical reflection, it knows there's something airborne in the room. And you can easily set these off with a, a vaping device by blowing on them. So um, now we've seen how it works. Let's take a look at this. It's worth mentioning that uh, it might look quite a small battery, especially when they're claiming five-year life. But the battery in this is a lithium cell. It's a CR2. And this is a non-rechargeable lithium cell. And the irony here is that this contains probably more lithium than, oh, I'm trying to think. I don't know the exact quantities, but a rechargeable cell that can be used over and over again contains the tiniest little trace of lithium. lithium. These ones contain a lot of lithium. It's like a good chunk of it. So actually, if you, you can buy them and actually source the lithium out of them, you can reclaim it from them. But uh, one of these would probably make possibly a hundred rechargeable ones. I always thought that was a bit wasteful. But having said that, it's just the way it is. But this is a very long shelf, shelf life and it's got a fairly high capacity, which is why they can offer that long lifespan. Uh, this has a label in it. The other one had a label too. I don't think you're supposed to remove it, but I've just removed it. It's got this little sort of peel-off silver label. Kind of... You'd think that would go in the outside because it does have an expiry date, replaced by end 2026. This unit also has a... Uh, it's got a base that goes in the ceiling. And if there's no battery in it, like most other smoke detectors, you can't hook it into the base. It will just fall out. It needs the battery to push down this little red plunger to remove a locking pin 
to allow it to go on the ceiling. So let's pop the battery in and now it will, it will lock into the base. Now I'm going to make this sound, so I'm just warning you in advance, it's going to make a sort of sweeping siren noise. So I'll put my finger over the end to reduce the volume, but I'm going to be making that noise now. So this unit, instead of just going peep, 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 like most smoke detectors, is actually doing that sweeping noise. And I wonder if that's to keep the circuitry simpler for the sounder, because by sweeping it, under like the control chips control, um, they allow for a tolerance, a manufacturing tolerance of the acoustic cavity because many of these sounders actually have feedback. They've got a third electrode on the piezoelectric disc that uh, will provide a signal back and it, it operates then at resonant frequency of both the disc and the cavity. But I'm guessing this might not be using that feedback circuit and the reason they're sweeping may just be partly because it's a distinctive noise but also so they hit the resonant frequency of this chamber over a sort of small uh, tolerance and that will result in the peak sound output. Um, let's open it up. That's what we do. I'm quite intrigued to see what's inside this. The reason the battery will last such a long time is that these things don't require that much current to operate because all they're doing is basically pulsing the infrared LED internally. And the sequence of events they go through... There's a little spring-loaded plunger and a spring has just popped out already, that's predictable. Here's the spring, I'll just try and pick that up and put it in there to keep it together. Um, the reason they can keep the current low is because uh, of the way they test. They basically, they have that cavity that detects the particles of smoke and they just, initially it might sample the output of the light receiver to see that it is actually, to, to get a reference and then it will pulse the LED and it will see what that level goes up to and it will expect, even without smoke, it will expect some level of reflection. If it doesn't see that reflection, then it knows that maybe something's gone wrong like the infrared emitter. It does look for a reflection for determination of valid operation. But it flashes that LED roughly once every, say, 10 seconds. And when it does that, if it detects that since the last level that it last sample it took, I'm guessing it keeps an average inside, but uh, if it detects a sudden change in the reflectivity, it steps up the sampling rate, it starts then actually doing uh, several steps in quick succession. And if, for instance, it, it detected, a, imagine a particle of dust went in, it saw that reflection off the dust, it'll pause, take another sample, and if it sees it's gone, and it's gone back to normal levels, it will then just switch back into sort of standby mode of one, one test every 10 seconds. But if it detects an ongoing level of haze in there, it will take several tests just to actually check that it is a valid alarm condition and then it will start uh, making the sounder go. I see an inductor here. I'm guessing these two wires may go down to the sounder. The inductor is to step the voltage up to the sounder. Um, it will have an element of a... Uh, depending on the circuitry, I've not seen the circuitry in this because I've not had this open, it may... It may have a resonance circuitry, but it's most likely that's just been used to boost the voltage up for the sounder disc uh, to get a just basically higher volume. So can I get uh, can I get this mesh out? Oh yes, I can. So I'm guessing this might be stainless steel or aluminium mesh. Probably stainless steel. Could be wrong. How does it react to a magnet? I've got a purple magnet here, wrapped up to, for... Oh, hold on, let's uh, unwrap my big neodymium iron boron magnet and see if it detects that, if it lifts it. It's inflating it, so that is a stainless steel mesh. And then I shall wrap my magnet up before I destroy something with it. Uh, big magnets, do you know why I got this big neodymium iron boron magnet? I use it to detect nails behind walls. It makes a really good stud detector. If you just run this across a ceiling, it will stick to the nails. And then if you then scan with the magnet, uh, it will then detect the next nails. And you can pretty much find where you've got a, well, a joist behind plasterboard, gyp rock in the ceiling. So uh, that's a complete deviation from the main subject of this video, but that's okay, that's what happens. So what, uh, excuse my stomach rumbling here, I've not had breakfast yet. So uh, how do I get this off? Here's the optical cavity. 
and it looks like it's using the chevron style approach to blocking light going through, although when you tilt at the right angle, you can see a light path through that. Okay. I wonder, because these detect the changes in light levels, and because obviously ambient light is going to find a way through, particularly dust, I wonder if these things are going to be disturbed by things like uh, electronic lamps, like LED lights that have distinct flicker, high frequency flicker or mains flicker, and I wonder if pointing a light directly at one of these would upset them in any way. But let's see if I can get this cover off. I don't know if this is going to come off. I don't know if it's glued on. This is where I destroy this, isn't it? Or is that clipped? This looks like it could be a clip, but I might be wrong. It's making slightly scrunchy, unhappy noises. Oh, let's see if I can impale myself and liberate blood. I don't think this detector will be going back together again after the look of it. Uh, it's the plastic is is distorting badly. My stomach really is rumbling now. That's annoying. Uh, right, I don't think this detector is going back together. That's all right, because that's why I buy them. So we can see what's inside so you don't have to take yours to bits. This is where I uh, undo this and I find there was a way to get it apart easily, but Tori, maybe not. Is this glued? I'm not sure it is. I think it's just clipped in really, really firmly. That bit seems to be for, actually, you know, that bit's for the uh, stainless steel mesh to go into, isn't it? Is this getting me any closer to opening it? Ah, not really. So what's actually holding this closed in that? It's not glued, I don't think. This is proving very destructive. Yeah, this this uh, this is where it's all gone horribly wrong, and it's now turning into a huge butcher fest. But not to worry. This is, as I say, why why I get it and take it to bits. Sacrificed for the greater good. That's why I bought two of them just in case I liked it. The other one is actually up on the ceiling now. So how is that fixed in? Is it just because it's a super tight fit? What on earth is holding that in place? Oh, it's actually, I think it might be glued. It's actually pressed in to uh, these little supports here. So is that going to, the one that's left in, is that going to leave her out or is it just going to, I think that's, it's glued in effectively, I think to those that lend bits, so that is very much a one-way trip. So here's the Pizza Electric transducer here. It's the disc of a, it's a metal disc with a layer of Pizza Electric crystal and then a metallization on the other side. Pizza Electric crystal is a crystal that has the characteristic that it's, when it's made, they raise it above its Curie temperature, apply a high voltage across it and cool it down and it holds that charge. And it means that if I press down this, it will actually generate a slight voltage, but uh, more importantly, if you apply a voltage across it, it will cause the disc to distort, and that's why these are used to make uh, the sounders. It's a very simple way of making a very high output sounder. So, can I get into this uh, ionization chamber now? I think this might be sealed shut as well, but... Um, I may have to pause and try and desolder this. I don't think I'm going to get into it because I think the LED, the emitters, are possibly, what are, well, they're certainly what's holding it onto the circuit board. Right, I'm going to pause momentarily. I'm going to stick the soldering iron on and I'm going to desolder this because I can see two pins going down here for either the transmitter, the, trans, the uh, emitter or the receiver, and then another two pins there so that they're at an angle. Um, into the sort of optical sensing cavity. So I'm going to desolder those and try and get it off so we can see what's on the other side of the circuit board. Hmm, super destructive. Let's uh, take a closer look at what the back of the circuit board. Sadly, it's really just fundamentally a blob of resin covering presumably a multiple of chips maybe? I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think I could get that resin off. I don't think it would be terribly productive getting it off. It's just going to destroy what was underneath. Double-sided boards, you can't see the outline of uh, the packages underneath. I'm guessing it is just a multiple of chips on there. 
So let's uh, zoom back out. It makes me wonder then, I was expecting a standard chip, but I'm guessing that maybe to allow it all to fit in such a small space, they've uh, used some cut, and also from the fact it has that sweeping sound, I'm guessing they may have used maybe a microcontroller and a separate uh, gain circuitry and just basically made it out of shop, not so much, well, modern discrete components. <laughs> there's a little click button aside, and there's a little side emitting LED for the button here for the test function. Um, this seems to be well sealed shut as well. It feels like it's glued shut. Uh, so I don't think I'm going to easily get this open without being destructive again. But having said that, I've started self-finish. Let's destroy it completely then. So uh, am I going to be able to prise this apart by using my pliers in inverse style? Yes, I am. Okay. So... Here's a smoke chamber. The detector is here and the emitter is here. I'll zoom down onto that so you can actually see this. So there's the emitter and there's the detector. And they're basically, they're looking into this area here, which has this barrier between them so they can't uh, see directly. And that means that the area that they're going to detect in oh, is going to be in this area here. Uh, the louvers at the side are overlapping, so that although I could see light shining through, it was actually down the side of this uh, thing. I don't think there is a direct optical route. Hold on, I'm just going to compare that. Yeah, the sensor here is just looking at a black surface. It's not going to see uh, any light coming in from the side because it is going to be blocked by these uh, sort of blades that allow the smoke to flow in but don't allow light to come in from the outside. And that is fundamentally it. It's got the infrared emitter, infrared, the receiver to detect the smoke, and the rest is unfortunately all concealed under this secret blob. But having said that, it may be a dedicated chip or it may be uh, the um, ex an existing circuitry, just they've put it on blob style just to save space. Although the, uh, the standard uh, smoke detector chips, they're not usually that big. Um... And there is still a fair amount of uh, circuitry on this in the form of surface mount. Uh, there's the sounder, so I'm guessing that these transistors, well, it might be two transistors are actually being used to drive that sounder. It's got three connections, so it could be a resonant, uh, it could be a push-pull configuration. Not sure. Uh, what are those uh, labelled, those transistors? S19 by the look of it. 619. They're both labelled 619, so they may actually be a sort of uh, push pull effect just to get maximum uh, flexing from this uh, transducer to actually get the maximum volume. So that's fundamentally it. It's quite a neat little thing. Uh, we can't explore it too deeply because it is quite heavily integrated. But, uh, the secret here is the design of the chamber with the uh, emitter and detector in it. And then the processing of the uh, in the circuitry, and then the fact they've used this small CR2 battery for maximum lifespan. Although it, because it is just uh, pulsing, uh, it doesn't uh, really require much power over a long period of time. I would say that because it it goes into an enhanced sensing mode. If you are using this in a, in a dusty area, the battery is like to last a little bit less time because it will go into the enhanced sensing mode more often. And um, it's also worth mentioning. Uh, they do recommend that you vacuum the unit. Whenever you're vacuuming the house, you could just pop the nozzle up and just suck around it to get the dust off the mesh and just maybe create an airflow that's going to pull dust out of here because that uh, should apply to most uh, smoke detectors have to be cleaned every so often, uh, just not with a, a moist cloth or anything like that, but just a, a, a vacuum cleaner to just get some airflow and just suck the dust away because if the, this blocks up with fur or fluff, uh, it's not going to, uh, if, if it gets furred up with fluff, then it's not going to be able to actually let the smoke uh, pass through it, the vapour. So, um, yes, I'll just add some vapour for a dramatic effect here. Oh, that wasn't much vapour, that was a uh, shit. But not to worry. Um, and as with all smoke detectors, if you've got one that you've had in your house for a very long time, uh, it's worth just changing them routinely every five or ten years. <clears throat> this one claims a five-year battery life, 
Maybe after five years, it may be worth just routinely changing them because they are very valuable devices in your house. They are your first defense against fire. Well, other than seeing it, if you actually cause it while you're there. Uh, much else to say about that? Not really. They're quite smart little devices. They're very compact. It'll be interesting to see if that other one uh, that I've put up, uh, how sensitive it is. I do know that I've got other optical sensors in the house, and when you are uh, using a vaping device, uh, which is actually empty, that'll be why there wasn't much vapor, uh, they are quite easy to trigger. Um, certainly in this area, I've got one fairly close to the bench, and it does trigger with the vaping every so often. But yeah, it's quite neat. It's very functional, and it's very smart.